Hi, this is Pete Georgiakakis uh, with EMS Leads. We're going to be going over medical direction today, and this is mostly geared for EMS students, but um, anyone that is not super aware of EMS will benefit from this. So we'll get right into it here. So we're going to go through the history of medical direction, the qualifications for a director, the roles, different cautions. Um, and then going through specifically these roles in more detail, including agency oversight, patient care, education, competency, and performance evaluation. So 1966 was the big time in EMS when Accidental Death and Disability was published. It's called the White Paper, and essentially it came out <laughs> saying an inexcusable amount of People were dying from trauma care, and so we needed to improve our care both in the field and then ultimately in the hospital. So at this point, there were 24 recommendations to improve EMS, and this became kind of the initial blueprint. In 1973 was the EMS Act that represented the first federal involvement uh, to help regionalize EMS, but even here, there was no mention of medical director. And in this 1973 Act, there were multiple things that an agency had to fulfill to get this government spending, but medical direction was not part of it. Through the 60s and 70s, you started to see services have medical directors, but there was really no clear guidelines other than there was a doctor here trying to help the ambulance drivers figure out what to do. In 1988, the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration began to include medical direction as an essential component of EMS systems. In 1996, the EMS Agenda for the Future uh, represented an update of the 1973 EMS Act and now had 14 recommendations to improve EMS moving forward. And one of the recommendations was that medical direction needed to be included for all levels of EMS providers. This eventually became a national standard under the Department of Transportation for EMS providers. Currently, though, it is still up to the state government to decide what the actual medical oversight requirement is. All states require that advanced life support services have medical direction, but it's not mandated for all BLS services. So what is a medical director? The American College of Emergency Physicians notes that the medical director is an integral component of the EMS agency. They should have ultimate authority over all clinical and patient care aspects of the EMS agency. And I think that's a really important distinction because this is not a administrative role in that it is not a hiring firing power. They can have input. They're not in charge of budget issues, but they can have input. They are strictly in charge of clinical decision making. They can credential a provider to administer care, but they are not the one that decides if the patient should remain employed. Um, each agency should have a specific job description because as you'll hear over and over, both in this channel and elsewhere, if you've seen one EMS agency, you've seen one EMS agency. And so every agency should have specific requirements for their medical director. Included in these roles should be the authorization to limit immediately the patient care activities of those who deviate from the established standards or do not meet training standards. So in other words, they get to decide who actually should be out there administering care and following the protocols that they've helped write. Uh, the medical directors are held to due process and cannot discriminate. So what kind of training does a medical director need? Well, this will also differ by state and agency, but overall some of the commonalities are they've had four years of college, four years of medical school, a residency, and depending on the field they're from, the length of the residency can vary. The most, I would say, common um, residency that they go through is emergency medicine, which is three or four years, depending on where you go. And then now since 2010, that it's become a fellowship, you might be fellowship trained as well. And that can be a one or two year fellowship, depending on the program. But no matter what, they have to be a physician that has completed a residency and is um, actively practicing somewhere. Some places require board certification and almost all states require some sort of state or national medical director course, and then some of these extra certifications of advanced cardiac life support, pediatric advanced life support, advanced trauma life support, and sometimes neonatal resuscitation, but these are all very state and agency specific. Overall, though, there are some consensus standards, 
and it must be a licensed physician who's clinically active. They understand the design and operation of EMS agencies, understand the local and regional EMS activity, administrative and legislative processes related to EMS, the scope of EMS skills and communications. They must also have some basic understanding of emergency medical dispatch, online, offline, off, online, offline medical director activities, training, QI, and then understand the local, regional, and state mass casualty and disaster plans. And these are all important because no matter what their job description is, they will interact with every facet of EMS in some way, if it's not ultimately under their purview from the get-go. For example, for me, I'm in charge of Johnson County Ambulance Service, but with that, I'm also in charge of our County Emergency Communication Center. So I oversee the dispatch center. I helped during this COVID-19 pandemic, I helped them design their call inquiry or call screening card. And it was only because of the fellowship training I had in emergency dispatch that I had any sense or understanding of what was even going on. Otherwise, it would have been a much more uphill battle. I know there's other medical directors that have a keen understanding of pre-hospital care, but don't necessarily know much about disaster planning, especially at a regional or state level. And that's an area even I'm still learning and I've had a fellowship, but it's just, there is tons of information that you really can be in charge of that you need to be aware of. So what are the various roles? Well, they have agency oversight. And again, this is all patient care related activities. They have to assess a provider's competency, which is their ability to actively care for patients. And often by the time you're applying for a job, you've already finished a training program, completed the national registry test, and then gotten a state license. So you've already proven a couple times that you have the entry level skills. And so many medical directors take that. And if you pass the HR screening, <clears throat> then you've made the cut and proved you're competent. Others have more robust training. I provide oral cases, both to graduating students in our program, as well as to um, new hires. And then there's also a written test. Credentialing grants the provider the privilege to actually perform these prescribed roles. So the medical director assesses competency. So can the provider uh, perform these duties? Do they have the ability? Credentialing is you now grant them the ability to do these things, and it's only based on if you feel they're competent. Quality assurance monitors performance and makes sure it's meeting the standards you've set. And this is the lifeblood of what medical direction does. This is the majority of how my time is spent is reviewing charts, making sure that we're following protocols. And if we're not finding trends that help identify maybe deficits in the overall understanding of a protocol or an area that we need to be training more because it's not a, a type of case that we deal with much, things like that. But it's constantly essentially taking the pulse of the agency and making sure how are we doing, how is our quality of service being provided. And then there's performance improvement, which is more a system level. And this monitors processes and outcomes more at the system level. Are there major issues? Are we having a lot of issues with <clears throat> a certain piece of equipment? Are we not interacting well with a certain other agency in our county, these kinds of things. And it's much more at a system level, not as much down at the staff member level. Then there's uh, the field clinical supervision, which I think is a vital part. This is where you build credibility with your crews, working with them in the cold on the side of the road. It's how you build mentorship. You engage in patient care yourself to show that you know what you're doing, <clears throat> And you also are appreciating firsthand the challenges that the providers are facing. You may have written a great protocol that works in a vacuum, but then you see how impractical it is once you're out in the field of your area. Then you also are going to be involved with regionalization and designations to ensure that the patients are going to the right hospital at the right time to get the right care. This is often being involved in uh, regional stroke care, <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, or STEMI care, PCI centers, making sure that um, if you are diverting to various hospitals, it is only for appropriate reasons and that it's not just your providers think one hospital is better than another, that kind of thing. It's truly that you are making sure that the right patients go to the right place. As I said before, you have to have a basic understanding of the EMD system. 
how standards are set, um, and then also are there issues within your EMD in your area that you need to reevaluate? You also need to be promoting research, which is a relatively new area of EMS, but this is where we move forward on the cutting edge. This is how we advance our field. So much of what we do is based on expert opinion. It's based on just anecdotes and based on trial and error. And so it's really time as best as we can in this difficult field of EMS where consent is a very difficult issue. There's a lot of ethical issues. Um, we have to be advancing the field as we can with appropriate research. You also act as a liaison between different healthcare organizations. Often if you're a practicing physician, you have a relationship with at least one hospital. You're gonna then have a relationship with this EMS agency, but you're also gonna be dealing with different departments within that hospital, uh, different departments within different hospitals, training centers, all that kind of thing. And so you need to make sure that you are truly making sure you're wearing the right hat when you are in your various roles to ensure that you're truly advocating for each agency. Then you also need to be promoting the health and wellness and providers. This is something that is part of the job prescription of fire departments, SWAT teams, um, disaster management teams, law enforcement. They have regular physical requirements that they have to be tested on. And yet EMS has none of these. Um, we lift patients daily. We have various things to help us, but we're in terrible positions as we're trying to administer care. We're in dangerous cars going fast, and yet there's no documented, you know, kind of standardized health and wellness requirements. Um, and yet when you look at the literature, and this is kind of its own talk, there is a high rate of smoking, sedentary lifestyle, and obesity within the EMS community, yet the, I would say the rigorous job requirements rival some fire departments and some law enforcement agencies. So it's very important for the medical director to know their providers. They need to know what they need, their strengths, their weaknesses, the needs of the citizens of their service area. And they have to just be staying aware of all facets of this agency so that they know how to help. Within a training program, they also need to know their students. So part of the accreditation of a training program is they make sure that the students could identify their medical director. So there's various ways you come into an agreement if you're a medical director with an agency. And it just, you have to know, depending again on your state requirements, your regional requirements, what kind of agency you're joining. And it could be a written agreement with the agency. This is the affiliation agreement. It gives a position description, the tasks expected, different criteria that show that you have met performance or not met it, different compensation, resources, liability coverage, process of dispute resolution. And this is essentially the contract. This is the contract between medical director and agency. Then if there's the agency city state regulations help define the role and authority, like this would be for a public entity like a fire department, um, that must clearly be noted within the agreement. Often if there's a third party involved, like a fire department, um, transit, airport, that kind of thing that have their own medical directors, then you need to make sure that all these things are clearly noted. Some medical directors can be an employee and they're hired within the agency. This is relatively rare, but can happen. Others are independent contractors where you are really just hiring out the medical director, the individual. And this is also a contractual obligation with a lot more risk on the medical director. You know, often you are, for example, with me, I'm a medical director of our county, but technically the University of Iowa has been contracted with the county and they have just happened to put me in that role. So contractually, my protection comes in under the University of Iowa. Um, and so it's not me, the individual that is the medical director, which offers me some more protection. And then there's some other ones that are basically verbal agreements that are practically kind of legal handshakes more than contracts. So some of the cautions that have come across my various conversations and reading are, you do not want to be involved in hiring or promotional decisions. Um, you can help review and give feedback, but you should absolutely not be the final decision maker because if there ever comes back to be some sort of litigation about 
favoritism or any sort of um, grievance about hiring, you can be named in the suit if it is not clearly delineated that you were not one of the decision makers. In addition, you need to be careful with disciplinary action. You should not be prescribing the discipline, but just be giving feedback and, and just giving advice to those that make this decision. Because again, if someone comes back with a wrongful termination suit, they can name you. Um, really where this comes in is if you revoke someone's privilege to practice, you want to make sure that you have very clear reasons. You have evidence that you tried to remediate and evidence that's objective of how they failed that remediation so that you revoke their license. Because often when you revoke their license, then the agency will say, well, we're paying you to be on the street. Our medical director says you can't practice on the street, so we're paying you for no reason, so we're done. And so you just want to make sure that your paper trail is adequate. You also really shouldn't be giving concrete things about budget. You can provide input and say, yeah, I think it's worth getting these extra cots or this piece of equipment for this and that reason, but you really should not be part of the budgetary decision. Um, and then you just need to be aware of any sort of conflicts of interest. For example, if you work for one of the two hospitals in your service area that are equal in all their resources, your medic should not be taking all the patients to your hospital. The caveat to that being if you're at the level one academic trauma center and the other hospital is a level three community center, obviously there should be certain criteria as we talked about where your stroke patients are going to the stroke center, or your level one trauma patients are going per field triage guidelines, that kind of thing. But if it's um, if there's any sort of political, financial, or professional conflicts of interest, make that clear from the beginning so that you are already figuring out together collectively how to navigate that if you choose to move forward. So let's kind of dive into the actual roles. So what is agency oversight? This requires frequent quality interaction with providers. It's not just waving at everyone and talking at everyone. It's getting to know your providers, getting to know their strengths, their weaknesses, how they think the protocols are going, what they view the county or whatever service area to be. It allows you to better identify strengths and weaknesses as you hear from those out in the field every day. It also helps you kind of guide your education and training because I think there's an initial assessment, as I said, when they get there, you learn at baseline where they're at, but then there's gonna be continuing education and based on what you're assessing and quality assurance, you wanna make sure that you're really hitting those areas of weakness and reinforcing the things that need to be reinforced. You really don't need to be practicing these very you know minutia based skills or if you're not going on many fire calls i don't know that you need to be spending a ton of time training on fire ground rehab versus ensuring that your cardiac arrest response and care is choreographed you know as near to perfection as possible one of the other big time consuming jobs is developing and revising medical um, standard operating procedures and protocols this is something that should be revisited at least once a year to make sure that your protocols are up to date. I strongly recommend that those protocols are evidence-based. Our protocol book that I revised has references in every protocol so that you know what studies, what books, what literature this is all based on. It's not just Pete Georgiakak has felt like doing this because it sounded cool. There is good evidence attached to each thing. And you just want to make sure every year that you're revisiting this with multiple people too. You know, often a protocol committee is useful that has multiple stakeholders involved, including field medics um, and EMTs, because you want to know, hey, I really wish I had this medication. Can we talk about it? Or, hey, this dose of ketamine that you have for chemical restraint, well, it makes us draw it up twice because of the concentration we have, and we can't do that with an agitated patient. Things like that, you really can... Uh, get your eyes open to some of these things that, again, you wrote it for a vacuum. Now you need to know what it's like out in the field. And this is a very important thing to protect both the citizens of your area as well as your providers. You also need to at least have a basic understanding of your medical emergency preparedness and disaster plan. This is often if you have areas of mass gatherings within your service area, like stadiums, concert halls, schools, that kind of thing. You want to know some of the basics have some discussions with your emergency management, uh, law enforcement, that kind of thing. And then 
you know, for us, obviously the big one was COVID-19. That's been a moving target from the get-go, but being able to meet with our stakeholders often, we were able to kind of deal with, you know, our emergency preparedness general general plan mixed with now the specifics of covid and we were able to collaborate with agencies all over the country to start to develop potential if we were to get to a surge kind of position what would be our no transport guidelines you know in cardiac arrest what are we doing with these covid patients that kind of thing and then of course one of your big roles as i said before is the medical related qi qa And this is really taking the pulse of your agency, making sure you're growing and making sure you're fulfilling your obligation to the public, but also making sure that the protocols are being followed. Then you also just want to have some sort of health and safety measures in place. Make sure your providers are mentally and physically being taken care of because it's a very taxing job and you don't want to push them into the ground and then not notice when things are faltering. So the protocols define the scope of care and recommended approaches to manage patient care situations. A lot of places use the state protocols, but the medical director does need to have final say and have reviewed them. And often in the protocols, there should be an area where it's signed that the medical director did review them. Standing orders are actions that can be performed without consulting someone because delay would hurt the patient. This is essentially what your protocols are. This is how you operate every day without needing to ask advice. This is when you come to an asthmatic, you give them albuterol. You don't have to call and ask to give albuterol. Um, You know, when you get to a patient in cardiac arrest, you start CPR, you defibrillate, you do an advanced airway, that kind of thing. Online medical control is direct communication or direct supervision. So in our county, we have an EMS fellow that rides with the crews. And so when that fellow is on a call, they're a physician, and so if there's something that requires a medical control call on scene, that meta, that fellow is the online medical control. If they don't have a fellow with them, they can call, and this will go to either one of two hospitals in our county, and they will speak to an ER physician who will then give them medical control advice. That said, the physician cannot ask um, a provider to do something outside of their scope of practice. Even if it starts to go outside their protocol, it gets a little hazy, but the important thing is there's a lot of times in protocols that it delineates when you get to this stage, call medical control for approval. One of the examples would be pain medication. When you've exceeded your first, let's say, opiate to the maximum dose, this patient's still in pain, you feel they need a second opiate. In our protocols, you have to call medical control to get permission just so that you can talk it out. Sometimes there's some advice, that kind of thing. Offline medical control is often done prospectively, so ahead of time, or retrospectively afterward. The prospective medical control even is training, um, where your physicians are giving you feedback and going, hey, we need to keep training on this so that when you're in this situation, you know what to do. Retrospective would be, hey, you were in this situation. This is kind of my take on it. So when you have a medical director in the field, I think this should be routinely done. This can be done as a ride along, or it can be individual in their own response vehicle or with a field training officer. They all have pros and cons. I think it's really important if you're new to get to know your medical director, I think it's great for them to ride along in the ambulances for a little bit. I think driving along with a supervisor, field training officer also has its benefits. And then once they're well-known, they can often respond very well in their own vehicle. This is a way for them to kind of evaluate the agency effectiveness out in the field and the quality of service given. It's a factual and observational assessment. It won't just be retrospective based on chart review. It also gives you opportunities to mentor and coach your providers. You can both lead by example, show your commitment again in the snow by the interstate, as well as provide credibility, but it can also If there's an advanced airway to be done, you can be talking them through it. If there's some sort of needing help with incident command, you don't need to be incident commander, but you can be nearby offering advice, that kind of thing. And then you also can be establishing initiatives to advance performance. So education standards. So EMS education requires a medical director. Um, They fall under the Allied Professional Health Schools um, under the Department of Education. And so there's initial certification and continuing education done 
in the accreditation period. It's more stringent with the initial certification. Um, the continuing education programs have a little bit different setup. But a lot of this is based on the National EMS Education Standards, which is a federal document that was developed by NHTSA. And it's one of the foundational document that takes into a lot of things into account. The 1996 EMS Agenda for the Future, the National EMS Core Content, which has the required content for each level of provider, and then the EMS Scope of Practice Model, which has the four levels of training, which is First Responder, EMT Basic, Advanced EMT, and Paramedic. So these educational standards have been created and they have four components. The competencies for each provider level, the knowledge required to achieve these competencies, clinical behavior and judgment requirements, kind of the affective measurements, and then the educational infrastructure, what you'll need to perform this education. And this ultimately provides a general framework to support individual programs in making their specific curriculum to meet the educational training needs. And so it's important to know as you're entering these schools what each of these training philosophies is, because ultimately, if they're accredited, they have all met these education standards, but they might do it in very different ways. So based on your kind of life situation, if you have a full-time job, you might need a place that only offers training at night, so it'll be much longer of a course. Other people want to do this as a full-time job for a bit, so they'll spend 10, 12 months through their training program understanding that they're not going to get paid during this time and then be done quicker. It just depends what you're going for. Some have now this reverse classroom where you do a lot of work at home. You come in for practical training and scenarios. Other places do the typical lecturing, skill stations, that kind of thing. And then within each provider level, there's also instruction, instructional guidelines. Continuing education is a little bit of a different beast because it has a little less oversight. It's a little more generalized. So the medical director is involved in developing and improving the continuing education of an agency to ensure accuracy and validity. And so this is also with regard to an agency, you know, you need to make sure that all your providers are maintaining their licenses. Um, and so often you can use your findings from QI to guide the educational content. If you're finding over a year, man, we're really struggling with our trauma assessments, maybe that's what you're gonna go through. Or it helps get your providers more up to date on current trends and evidence-based advances. For example, ketamine and pain control, superglottic airway versus endotracheal intubation. If there's certain assessment areas, like I said, that aren't frequently used, this would be a great time to do it. You know, your newborn assessments, PALS algorithms, drowning patients, assessing patients for their ECMO potential. And then you also just wanna make sure that the certifications and licensures are being renewed, such as whatever your agency requires, ACLS, PALS, PHTLS, that kind of thing. So competency verification, this is again pretty individualized, but it's just important that the medical director has some sort of direct role in evaluating and refreshing their skills. I believe this should happen at initial hiring because this is how you get to know them as a provider. And then there should also be periodic evaluations thereafter. So for us, when we put out these new protocols, after a year, there was a protocol test to determine have they established an understanding of these new protocols. And then you really need to be assessing their cognitive, psychomotor, and affective domains. Cognitive being the actual knowledge, psychomotor being the carrying out of the skill, and the affective domain is more of the how they interact with people, do they understand why they're doing it, that kind of thing. The other big thing you wanna do, but not let it dictate all your training, is to evaluate the low frequency but critical skills. So RSI, if you have it, needle decompression, surgical airway, baby delivery, that kind of thing. Performance evaluation, again, this is more at an agency level. So you've been doing QA, QI for patient care activities more at the provider level. Now we're looking at the system as an agency. You know, do we have performance measures that we're trying to meet? We wanna get off scene of traumas within 10 minutes. How often are we meeting that? And then you have benchmarking that sets targets based on known standards. So you can have your internal standards or your external standards based on something, you know, door to balloon time of what they desire in the stroke literature or some sort of sepsis identification in fluids or how fast do we need to be transmitting our 12 lead EKG, that kind of thing. You 
can start to evaluate how are we stacking up against the country and against our own internal goals. This is very similar to the NFPA guidelines talking about response time, a certain percentage of the time they have to be responding within 90 seconds. And, and then based on if they're meeting that percentage or not, they have to reevaluate how they do things. This is very similar. Other areas that medical directors might be involved is with their ambulance service accreditation, their educational program accreditation, research, and then as advocates for health and safety and wellness. So specifically to the University of Iowa, um, in the EMS Learning Resources Center, that's our EMS school that has EMT basic and paramedic programs, as well as a lot of AHA classes. We also do some nursing classes, advanced trauma life support, all kinds of things. We're also a testing center. So I oversee the activities there as the medical director, which involves the didactic teaching, skill stations, AHA classes, evaluating the affect of students. I do some teaching myself, I assist in their final terminal competencies and provide oral cases to our graduating paramedic students as a final evaluation of if they're ready, as well as I, we are annually looking at our curriculum and continuing to review it, update it, and continue to advance it. I have read every test question they will take and we have changed and adjusted and some of our testing is standardized. So we have appealed to the committee that makes this when there's a a question we don't feel is up to the literature, that kind of thing. So we really, I am very involved. I feel like the students know me well, because I think it's really important that you get to know them so that you know who you're sending out into the workforce. So when you sign their diploma, you know who you've sent out. With Johnson County, because it covers a wide variety of um, types of agencies, I have various roles. So the ambulance service, I helped rewrite their protocol book to be a little more updated um, and evidence-based. And so that's about 280 pages of protocols, medication, fact sheets, references, pictures, graphs, all that kind of stuff. And then I'm daily going through chart review to ensure in certain types of calls, cardiac arrest, stroke, respiratory distress, death on scene, high-risk refusals, those kinds of things. I'm trying to review those as well as just taking a random sample every month and seeing how are we doing. I'm also on the QI committee, making sure that we are overall learning as, a, as an agency how to be performing QA and QI and changing this culture of it being punitive to more just being educational and truly how do we improve the quality of our care delivery. And then finally with training, you know, when we're hiring new people, I like to be involved, see where they're at with their cognitive uh, abilities and psychomotor skills. And then with continuing education, we're constantly trying to determine what do we need to be training with based on what we see in the QI and any sort of protocol issues. And then before COVID happened, the goal was to be out in the field with them more often, but we also have our EMS fellow who is out in the field for about 48 hours a month with them. And so I work with them and hear how things are going from their standpoint too. But I get out there when I can, because I think it's very important. With our first responder agencies, I review their protocols and receive a certain percentage of their charts every year. They just changed the laws lately in the state of Iowa. And so I actually help um, define what they need in their inventory. And that's based on the number of calls they have, the types of providers they have, and just based on what their apparatus setup is. With the communication center, I'm getting their review numbers. They have a very robust internal QI, QA program and compliance program that's very strict and dictated by national guidelines. And so I'm often just being informed of how we're doing and where we need to be fixing things. If there is some sort of conflict between how the providers feel things are being coded for dispatch, then I try and help figure out how can we optimize both sides because the EMD that's used is evidence-based and validated. And so you don't want to start changing things based on opinion, but you do need to look at the specifics of your county. You know, are there types of calls that are being downgraded? Are there types of calls that are not being said emergent when we should be that kind of thing? And then, like I said, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we had to develop a call screening form and we've had to go through probably four or five iterations of that card to make sure as symptoms, according to the CDC, are changing, are we appropriately catching them in our questions? 
And so then I also work for the University of Iowa, but we have two other hospitals in our service area. And so I'm a liaison between all. And so I'm always reassuring everyone that when I'm wearing my Johnson County hat, I'm not a University of Iowa employee with those interests in mind. I have Johnson County interests in mind. And then I, we work very closely with the medical examiner, law enforcement, fire departments, all that. I also have the opportunity to speak quite a bit at various EMS days in our county and other counties, speak at our state conference, I um, presented at our national conference, but you know, EMS is a small community, but there's still very broad effect. And I think it's really important to keep harvesting those relationships. And then we try and be advocates at the county, state, and national level for our providers. So that's kind of all I got here. This is um, just basic overview of what a medical director does. I hope it was useful and we'll talk to you next time.